Welcome again, everybody, to another episode of TOSP, the official Cyborgs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And we have a rather shorter than usual, but still interesting, collection of strange science-y articles from across pl- Cyblogs and across the net today. Mm. So we, uh, without further ado, Amy, what are we going to be looking at today? Well, we're going to be looking at um, the human connectome or the brain's connectome. We're going to be talking about iridescent moles. Um, we're also going to be talking about urchins. And we've got a number of Cyblogs posts that we're going to chat to, including things like a physicist's uh, a physicist's lament, rather. Love that title. <laughs> and science and weight loss. So uh, it should be an interesting one. And there's a couple of opportunities here for uh, Elf and I to, to rant this evening. So so that should be interesting. I, I hope so. <laughs> so tell me more about this connectome. Right. Well, so this is quite interesting. This came out a, a couple of days ago and is, is now rocking up in, in uh, a number of journals. But basically what's happened is that um, – over the last couple of years, well, over over many many years now, obviously human beings have been very interested in this 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 thing that runs our bodies, known as the brain, and it's been really tricky figuring out exactly what's going on in it because you can't cut into a living one generally and expect that it'll stay the same. Well, not not the kind of way you can with other things. So it's remained fairly mysterious, and we've got things like um, MRI, which is magnetic resonance imaging, and and so forth, and and so. Our understanding of its structure is getting better, but <clears throat> what they're, they're now hailing it, or, or some people are hailing it now, is the first new perspective on neuroanatomy in 100 years, which to me sounds like PR speak, but nonetheless may be true. Um, researchers over the last couple of years have gotten an awful lot better at imaging the brain, and, the, and the, part of the reason that we're so interested is, is that uh, particularly sort of cognitive people and neuroscience people uh, believe that, that all cognition emerges from um, the interplay of, of electromechanical, sorry, electrochemical rather, impulses um, along the brain circuitry. So, for example, we're able to do things like call a word to mind, apply the rules of grammar, and then voice it aloud in 600 milliseconds or less. So, so it, it works all really, really, really fast. Um, and so the, the team that they're talking about here has apparently devised ways to, let, let me look at the numbers here, to make magnetic resonance brain scans seven times more quickly and to analyze neuro, neural connections 50 times faster than they could a year ago. Um, and they've invented a couple of new techniques um, as well. And the idea is to figure out how all of the neurons that make up the brain are actually connected to each other. Uh, we know that they are, but mapping it is 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 quite a bit trickier. So it's, to put this into perspective for, for people, the average human brain contains about 100 billion neurons, right, which are the sort of the very specialized cells in the brain because there are other types of cells as well, but they're the very specialized cells in the brain that carry the, electro, the electrical impulses that end up in thought. Um, now that's 100 billion is about as that's the number of stars there are in the Milky Way, right? And they reckon that this makes for about 150 trillion or so connections. Uh, the connections are also known, yeah, the connections are known as, as synapses. So apparently with, with our current technologies, it could take researchers years just to trace like the 10,000 or so synapses, uh, synapses rather that branch from just a single neuron. Um, it's, it's a million times more connections than the genome has letters of DNA, and think about how long it took researchers to do that. So that's that's an idea of the scale of um, the 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 problem. No, that's a poor word. The challenge, uh, <laughs> the challenge ahead of us. And the idea is, you know, if we can understand um, these connections better and the structure a lot better, we can start to understand things. For example, like schizophrenia, which we're starting to think might have to do with with I don't know. I guess you could call it short circuiting. Something going wrong with the connections. Um, so they're going to be looking at, uh, I mean, they're pumping, um, there's the Human Connectome Project. So Connectome was coined a few years ago, and it's literally just <laughs> the connecty bits. <laughs> it's the tangle of cells and synapses. You can see where the name came mm-hmm. from. It's like genome and everything's something ohm these days. Proteome. Everything's got an ohm. Um, so over the next five years, um, a 
there's forty million dollars being pumped into um, the human con human connectome project by the National Institutes of Health in the states, and they're going to be scanning lots and lots and lots of brains, and and including um, twins because they're very interested, of course, mm -hmm. in not only looking at um, how these neural cells are all connected, but in also trying to understand the underlying genetics of this because that becomes very interesting as well. Um, and there are a number of other projects, smaller ones, that are also being started that will feed into this. And I think one of my favorite things about this is to hear that a number of the people involved in this research are very strongly pushing forth the same thing that happened for the Human Genome Project, which is sharing all of the data openly. This is and should be an open science project. Rather than sitting on it and everybody sort of fighting for a little patch of ground, which tends to hold up the works insanely with uh, um, stuff like this, there's a lot of encouragement going into getting scientists uh, yeah, to publicly release and share their data with each other. I know with the Human, Human Genome Project, there was actually a huge international political accord signed and it was compulsory. So we'll watch this over the next few years, as one does with science, to see what comes out of it. But there are already um, just stunning things that, that have been coming out of research like this. There's a, a $55 million human brain atlas um, that is going to be coming out soon, and it's an interactive guide, and that's going to be coming out soon. Um, in November as well, a three-dimensional high-resolution map of the neural connections in the mouse brain, for example, was released. So very, very, very cool. And extraordinarily pretty as well. Yeah, that's, <laughs> ah, well, I can't believe I missed that. Yes, we'll, uh, obviously, as always, we'll link to this, and you can have a look at the, there are photos and there are interactive graphics showing this, this unbelievably sort of convoluted, tangled web of, of connections. It's startlingly beautiful. It looks like something from Lewis Carroll's nightmares. It's amazing. It does a little bit. This is what happens the, when you, this is your brain on science. <laughs> Actually, the thing that reminds me of the most is uh, hanging on the wall in my bedroom. I have a picture of the uh, the brain bow, which is just after they started using uh, green fluorescent proteins and things. Um, this is a protein, a fluorescing protein they derived from jellyfish. It won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008. They developed it in all different colours and then they mm. uh, applied it to um, the mouse brain and they mapped ah. neurons by the different colours. And they called it the brain bow yeah. because you see this uh, in 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 this case, uh, it's a two-dimensional map of the different uh, expressed proteins and different neurons, and the brain of the mouse is just a glorious rainbow. But what this connectome has done is it's taken that and put it into three dimensions mm. and given it some real physical significance. Mm. <laughs> really, really impressive work. <laughs> oh, absolutely fantastic. I kind of, oh, I, I feel slightly overdone for my article now, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it my best because <laughs> I think it's pretty as well. So as many of our listeners will be aware, one of the big problems facing uh, not only just us here in New Zealand, but people worldwide is uh, trying to treat water. So trying to remove things like heavy metals, organic dyes, inorganic dyes, all kinds of the horrible stuff that we human beings or cows or anything else chuck into the water. Mm. And long story short, it turns out that nanoparticles are a really good way of doing this for a, for a bunch of reasons. But you can think of it, uh, it's essentially like the difference between throwing a loaf of bread onto the fire versus throwing a pack of flour onto a fire. And if you've <laughs> never done that... We suggest you burns. don't. <laughs> yes, we suggest you don't. Don't try this at home, children. Um, the bread slowly smoulders away, but a throwing flour on your fire will actually cause a giant plume of flame. Uh, and that's because of surface area. So one of the cool things about nanoparticles is that when you start making things that small, uh, you begin to get huge increases in surface area. And this most commonly leads to huge increases in reactivity. This has some real legitimate medical concerns because it means that when you make things like gold or silver or anything nanoscale, it can be much more reactive than it is on a normal scale. But in applications like water treatment, you can use that reactivity to your advantage. And so for a number of years now, we've been making these kind of water purity, uh, water purification things on the nanoscale, making them with nanostructures so that they are able to purify water much more efficiently and usually at significantly less cost to the environment. Unfortunately, most of the nanoparticles that we use at the moment are either very, very, uh, are made out of toxic chemicals or are very complex to produce or are very costly to produce. Uh, essentially, it's, it's not easy. It's, you know, I mean, you wouldn't expect it to be that easy. 
But uh, a new paper published this week in uh, Advanced Materials, um, which is a nanotechnology journal I follow, it has a wonderful title called Template Free Formation of Uniform Urchin Like Alpha Iron Oxide Hollow Spheres with Superior Capability for Water Treatment, which uh, sounds like complete gibberish. But it's actually quite interesting. What these researchers have done is that they've taken iron oxide nanoparticles, and we've been using iron oxide nanoparticles to purify water for quite some time. But they're not that Good. Now, iron oxide is quite common. Many people will be familiar with it as the rust that sits on their cars. Mm. Uh, and it turns out when you nanostructure this, it can be used to remove horrible things like heavy metals and dyes from waterways. So, yay there. Unfortunately, it's not as good as these highly toxic or highly complicated counterparts. So that's a problem. What these researchers did is they mixed it with, uh, they put it in an emulsion. So this is a mix of glycerol, water, and iron iron oxide and an emulsion that most readers will be familiar with most listeners will be familiar with is milk (laughs) and then they heated it and what happened next was amazing they got these tiny little nano spheres and it's pretty common and made out of iron oxide but they heated them in such a way so that instead of these nano spheres swelling up like a balloon they exploded into spikes and what they've done is they've created nanoscale things that look for all the world like sea urchins they are covered in all of these spikes <laughs> or um, what are they called nano flakes um, essentially by changing the reaction mechanism by changing how much glycerol that you mix in with these you can completely change the the morphology of these little particles you can make them uh, crusty, you can make them covered in flakes like the spines on a stegosaurus's back, or you can make them look identical to a sea urchin. Um, The only difference being that these are about a hundred billion times smaller. (laughs) I got that right? No, sorry, about a billion times smaller. But, um, and the reason you want to do this is because these spikes have a huge, 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 huge increase in surface area, and it blows their efficacy off the charts. It's much more uh, efficient in terms of producing these, and it's also much more efficient in terms of how quickly they're able to extract heavy metals and things from water supplies. So just a heads up for, for this, awesome. not only is it a green way of producing these nanoparticles, um, but it has huge implications for water water purification and any other kind of purification that you're interested in too. Wow. And it looks cool. Fantastic. I just love the idea of tiny little spiky nano things cleaning stuff up and being friendly. And I, I will <laughs> blog about this this week. I'll chuck the p- photos up because they're just, they're just incredible. They're not quite at the, the, the connectome level of awesome, but well, they're pretty cute. They're, they're pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> I have I have a little um, uh, soft toy plush toy influenza virus <sighs> sitting next to me at the moment, yeah. and I'm thinking I might have to upgrade to a little plush toy spiky sea urchin nanoparticle. <laughs> well, with with modern uh, technologies, you can. We can rebuild it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, cool! Thanks for that, Alf. Um, yeah, I've got two things coming up next. One of which is very quick, but I think this is lovely. So, I'm I'm for for people who weren't aware of this, I'm something of a tech geek. I'm I'm a fan of the technology. I welcome our robot overlords and and all the rest of that. And uh, one of the cool new things that's come out is is New Zealand science institutions have started to twig to this newfangled computer technology. <laughs> and new, some of them yeah, and newfangled app technology and things uh, and there's a new app out called NZ Fauna uh, Fauna rather yeah, well Fauna in terms of some of the animals that are on it possibly at some point soon but anyway New Zealand Fauna by Kiwipedia and it's um a number of our science organizations got together I'm trying to remember the exact website but I think like Math and Doc may have been involved but, but certainly a couple of the big science ones. And this is a lovely little app for um, your iPhone or your iPad. Um, it's free. And it has a number of beautiful screenshots and descriptions and sounds and movies.